Blessing to have family involved. And we're truly in the great controversy, but we're led by someone who cannot lose. And he will not lose this battle. Praise God for that. Um, our topic today is just set my timer. Our topic today is the Godhead as revealed to man, as revealed to man. And God is a phenomenal communicator. I remember when I first heard that, I was like, hmm, is that true? Well, how could it not be true? He invented communication and all that came with it. 
So let us pray for him to communicate with us as we learn what he has revealed. Let us pray. Kind and loving Father in heaven, we thank you again for coming before us and uh, giving us truth and light and understanding, for preserving your holy word, for giving your prophets inspiration, even under tremendous duress, dear Lord. Father, we are glad that you are the God that cannot lose, Father, and that you will give us understanding through your Holy Spirit even now. We pray based on your mercy and our great need. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, anytime we go to the Bible, we pray and we look for what God is saying, and we go according to the weight of evidence, the weight of evidence. Um, and this is very important because in any situation just about, there's something that is slightly off, but from the weight of evidence, we come to our conclusions, and that's what God wants us to have, right? We are on looking at to the Godhead, and many people are wondering if there isn't is there even a God out there, you know? And really the evidence is pretty simple. It's obvious that there is a God out there, right? Imagine that you have clothing without a seamstress or someone who makes clothes. Imagine that there's a car without a manufacturer. Imagine that there's a phone without someone who builds the phones. Imagine that there is a, a robot without someone who makes the robot. And now we have, what do we call it, AI, right? Okay, closer to my, all right, that's good. All right, a little bit better. Imagine that someone has made an artificially intelligent um, um, robot and no one programmed it. No one gave it sequences of clarity of understanding and if then else statements to produce what it's doing. Imagine a human body without someone who created. Imagine that. How could that be? And for the youth out there, or those of us who used to play video games, right, and those who actually get immersed, I don't know if you've played the art of the um, the games that have you in a virtual reality, um, or a metaverse kind of situation, or maybe if you've gone down to the Bible Museum and you've put on those, you've you've um, put those that thing on, and you're immersed in this world, you're looking around, right. And what I tell the, the people who are wondering, is there proof that there's a God, right? I say, listen, remember those video games and remember um, that everything in that virtual reality, the birds, the sounds, the images, every single thing was programmed by someone. The way it interacts, the, 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 the shapes, the sounds. And I said, now close your eyes and think about that and not open your eyes. What that you see was not created and organized by someone. Everything that you see here, the fabric of reality is designed by an intelligent being. Everything, there is proof that he exists in front of your face as you breathe, as you hear, as you uh, coordinate, as your emotions have sequences of logic and understanding and feelings. When you put something down, you don't look over here to get it. There's logical sequences. Guess what? Someone had to make that so, right? When I step over here, my feet don't end up over there, right? When you park your car, unless somebody stole it, you go back to where it was. Guess why? Someone created that, just like in that artificial world. And we submit to you, it is the God of this holy word, the Bible. And he has revealed himself in our world. So it is what he's revealed. The secret things belong to, but those things are, that are revealed belong to us, his children. And so we talk about the Godhead. And I try to utilize the words that are utilized in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Uh, some people utilize different words, but I like the Godhead. And we go by the weight of evidence. Isaiah 28, Isaiah chapter 28, uh, verse 
9 and 10, what does it say to us? Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. What does it say? Some of us already know what it says, right? In the book of Isaiah. And it's one of my um, um, favorites because it denotes a sequence to understand, to understand. Isaiah 28, we're looking at verses 9 and 10. Everyone should have it by now. What does it say? Whom shall I teach? Knowledge. It's a question. What else? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast? You know, to that thought, it's interesting. Um, my wife and I were studying the other day, and we have um, four children. And she uh, nursed those children um, um, until they were finished. Now, in the sequence of nursing, there's something, and you mothers who've nursed know, called a cluster feeding. When the baby, the child, the infant, starts to feed more and more and very frequently, and they do that because they're about to go through a growth spurt, right? If you're a young Christian, you're known as a baby, and you yourself know as a child in Christ or as coming back to Christ, could you get enough messages, sermons? What after and another and another one? And who was that? It could be Walter David Ashwick, Doug Basher, um, you no, know, Lyle Albrecht, uh, Mark Finley, you know, it, it, again, some more and another one and more. You are cluster feeding as a baby because you're going to grow. Let me say something else. If that baby doesn't cluster feed, is everything okay? If as a young baby Christian, you don't go through, go through that process naturally as God would have it, is something wrong. We must examine ourselves. When we start to say, our, I remember when I had a series by David Asterix, I think there was 28 in the series, I was speaking to somebody and the guy said, man, that's, that's one, that's like half the year right there because you just listen to one every Sabbath. I, I, I thought that was so shocking because I, I could not get enough time to listen to every single one on that series. I'd send it to Allison, uh, Walter Veit, we sent it. We were listening to like four hours a day. I was there at work looking at my screen. Somebody came here and said something to me and I kind of looked at them and looked, went back. I was listening, I sent it. We were, we, I was at the website, and at the time, they had the, the URL the, 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 and the, um, the name of the video. But if you went backwards in the directory system, you could see all of them. And we were pushing out all. The point I'm trying to make is learn the growth of the babe into growing up, into eating meat, and understand there is a sequence. And if you've missed a step, understand that maybe you were distracted by something. Maybe something else was there that was holding you back as you were taking in milk and you didn't do the cluster feeding. It was enough to listen to five minutes uh, on the radio. It was enough to hear one Bible verse. Oh, man, that'll hold me for like a week, you know? All right, next week, brother, I'll come back for the Bible study, all right? What was that verse? I can't even remember, but you tell me next week. He come back to them the next week. Oh, what, what was that verse again? Oh, you, you, you tell me, brother. You tell me. Go ahead, brother. Read. No, 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 no. You read it for me. You read it to them. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll see you. That's enough. No growth. No growth. Isaiah 28. Who shall I teach knowledge? Make to understand doctrine, wean from the milk, drawn from the breast. 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. He repeats it, right? 
If you preach upon precept, what is the concept that you're learning from the Bible? Is it about marriage? Is it about eating? Learn the different places where it is in the Bible about that. Go and glean from there. You will see the puzzle pieces come together. And when you're putting a puzzle together, what do you need when you're putting puzzle pieces together? You need all the pieces. You need a picture of the full image. Right? When you're putting little pieces together or else you try to force something together that doesn't go and you will not know you're missing some of the pieces. All right? Be taught of God. So precept upon precept, right? And if you, if you don't have the idea of marriages, how will you know you're missing some of the pieces? How about finances? The lesson is talking about it. The Sabbath school lesson. How do you know you're missing some of the pieces? You follow what I'm saying? And we're going into the Godhead because we have to understand how to study and how to go from the weight of evidence and not be like, hey, maybe, maybe there's something else over there. And since I have 10 things over here and I have a half a thing over here, I won't believe. No, no, I still think that, you know, maybe there's something over here. Weight of evidence. And understand that God is going to teach you and you don't, you're the one who don't know. And if this weight is over here and it was studied out, then this that is uncertain over here is going to come in line or your mind is going to come in line. Does that make sense? All right. Here a little, there a little, line upon line. If you read here, you don't understand, read the line above it. You don't understand, read it in context, in context, right? For instance, there's the word in the Bible for wine. Mm -hmm. What kind of wine am I talking about, someone? Ah, uh, it depends on the context. Guess what other word you need the context to know who they're talking about? Thank you. I think we've been talking. It's the word Elohim, God. Do you know that that same word is used to refer to Ashtoreth and Baal, who are false gods? So when we struggle about the wine thing, God is there too. The same Hebrew word, Elohim or El. We must know the context. It says false gods or false El, that it must be a demon. But if it's the almighty, it must be the God of heaven. All right? Line up in mind, precept for one precept. All right? The Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that. And what has been revealed also through the spirit of prophecy says that. Um, and on this aspect of doubts, it says Satan, this is from uh, Councils for the Church. This is page 93, paragraph 4. Satan has the ability to suggest doubts and to devise objections to the pointed testimony that God sends and many think it a virtue, a mark of intelligence in them to be unbelieving and to question and quibble. Those who desire to doubt will have plenty of room. God does not propose to remove all occasion for unbelief. That's the occasion for unbelief, right? You have choices. He gives evidence which must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and a teachable spirit. You've heard if you've done some personal development or going to classes, they say you must be teachable. You have to be teachable. Not someone who, oh, no, I already know. And I already, no, 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 brother, I, I already know that. Okay. All right. I see you already know. All right. Good day, sir. <laughs> May I'll pray for you. But believe me, when you reach that, it doesn't make a lot of sense to continue pushing on. You, the environment must be correct. Humble mind and teachable spirit, right? With careful investigation. Do we know how to investigate carefully? Right? Us as, as parents, you go into a room, you hear a crash, and you go into a room, and a child is looking at something there. It must be that child that knocked it over, right? Or is it the child that ran faster? Right? The one that the one that came in and is looking at it. They possibly didn't do it, but the one that did, they're gone. So you come in the room and you're like, 
What did you do? You haven't carefully investigated. Right? You're looking at circumstantial evidence. We must carefully investigate and be calm about it. Okay. And all should decide from the weight of evidence. So we know it has to be the weight of evidence, right? God gives sufficient evidence for the candid mind to believe, but he who turns from the weight of evidence because there are a few things which he cannot make plain to his finite understanding will be left in the cold, chilling atmosphere of unbelief and questioning doubts and will make shipwreck of faith. Guess what? The reality is there are more things that you don't understand than you understand. You don't understand completely how physics is holding this whole thing up. Can you write out the formula? For how there's gravity and the, there's structural beams and the architecture of this whole, you know how to build a building? But you're here, you're sitting down, you have no issue with it, right? The regular things we use, you don't even know how it works, right? The digestive system, do you know that digestion starts in your mouth? Didn't you know that? Some people do, but how? Why? Which enzyme is it in your mouth that, that, that starts with? Which one is it? <laughs> I think it's amylase, but anyway. <laughs> you follow, but you eat anyway. And God is saying, listen, your mind is finite. You don't understand everything, but I'll reveal it to you, okay? All right. To our scripture, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. What does that say? Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And we're going to go into 21. And we appreciate uh, Malachi for reading and being willing. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. You have to have a thankful heart, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. And we have to be careful of our imagination, which way it takes us. We should be going the way God takes us. Okay. And of course, God doesn't compel any men to give up their unbelief before there is light and darkness. Before them are light and darkness, truth and error. It is for them to decide which they will accept. The human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong. God designs that men shall not decide from impulse, but from weight of evidence, carefully comparing scripture with scripture. The call of the enmity that God put between us, even a child can know when something is wrong or right, right? If a child has, um, you know, put something together and made the thing, and then you take it from them, they're like, hey, hey, what's the matter? Something's wrong. <laughs> you took something from me that I made. You follow? And enmity allows us not to be completely under deception and to completely accept it without a chance to God. So he's put within us the understanding of good and evil. All right. Elohim the word that is used for God, and we can find it in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter, well, many places in the Bible, but one of them is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, and if you're if you're looking in your Bible, you'll notice there's something about that word, Lord. What do you notice about that? It is all capitalized. When it is all capitalized, it is taken from the Hebrew word Yahweh, right? And also it's translated as Jehovah, and it means the self-existent or eternal, the self-existent or eternal, meaning in and of this being's own self, they are eternal. They don't need anything from outside, anything from inside. They have always been. 
And it says the Lord our God is one Lord. And that word one there is, is the Hebrew word ekad, which is from, um, it means unified. And it's the same word utilized in Genesis for the husband, the wife shall be one flesh, meaning that they they merge into one person, right? It means that two people are in perfect harmony and unity. So it says the Lord our God is one Lord. And the word God there in verse four, if you look at used Strong's Concordance, there's free ones that you can utilize. The word God there is Elohim, Elohim, and it is actually plural, is actually plural, right? And we understand that God said at one point, let us make man in our own image. Let us make man in our own image. So we understand that it is more than one person speaking, right? But yet they are it one as in unity. They're of one mind and heart, but they are individual persons, entities, right? Okay, and there's multiple places in the Bible that we see this, right? And we know that there's the Father and the Son, and then some have um, options, they have questions, well, where do we get the, the Holy Spirit in this? Um, and of course, this is a fine question from finite minds, right? And so to know the answer, it must be revealed by God himself. Otherwise, we can't, now that we're, after sin, it's he is invisible, right? Do we have trouble believing in things that we can't see? You really do? Yeah? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. You ever saw, um, who can see their, their breath now? You can see it? Really? In winter, you can see your breath. Yeah? Okay, what's in it? Yeah? What percentage of oxygen do you need? Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can see air all around us, right? You can see our atmosphere here? Oh, okay. So you have you have problems believing that, right? Oh, okay. You have no problem believing stuff that is invisible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's invisible. And when did you even start to question your breath? How old were you? Two and a half? <laughs> when you thought you knew something, hey, how come I can breathe? What am I breathing? Is it air or oxygen? You know, oxygen is extremely flammable. Did you know that? If, we, if there was 100% oxygen in this room and someone held up a lighter, you better scramble for that door and just dive through whether it's open or not. You understand me? 100% oxygen is super, I could just go click. This whole room would just go whoosh. And it would also suck the oxygen out of your lungs. So guess what? It can't be 100% oxygen that you're breathing. Who made that percentage? Have you ever seen them? Invisible, just like what you're breathing, okay? The invisible things are there, and the invisible things are real. We use them all the time, okay? So when God is revealing this stuff to us, understand there's stuff that we cannot see, and also stuff that we cannot perceive. We have five senses, and even with our senses, sometimes we can't perceive. So don't get caught up on, oh, I can't see it. I've never... Okay, <laughs> all right. This is from Councils on Health 223. The Godhead was stirred with pity for the race and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. So how many people were involved? How many persons of the Godhead were involved? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, another study would be is Ellen White, a prophet of the living God. How do we know that? The Bible has to say that she is. So on your own, 
do that study and come to the conclusion based on the weight of evidence. And the weight of evidence is that she is a prophet of the living God. Okay, read her writings and compare it to the, with the holy word of God because this is the test of whether or not she's a prophet. And if she passed this test, then she is okay to trust because the Bible said she's okay to trust. And therefore, if she says something onto that same inspiration, we can believe it. Right? Okay, therefore, these are her words here and they come from inspiration, just like the writers of this came from inspiration. Okay, so she says in the plan of salvation, how many were involved? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gave themselves, themselves as capital, to the working out of the plan of salvation in the order, in the order fully to carry out this plan. It was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself an offering for sin, an offering for sin. All right? We dealt with uh, Jehovah, we dealt with um, Yahweh. And in this um, scripture, um, going back to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And we were created to do such. If we're not, it's out of order, by the way. And God has a right to recreate as he originally planned. Does that make sense? All right. It also says here in the ministry of healing, the personality of the father and the son also, the personality of the father and the son, also the unity that exists between them are presented in the 17th chapter of John in the prayer of Christ for his disciples. Right? What does it say? Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. By the way, just in case you didn't think Jesus prayed for you, it just said he just prayed this now. And his prayer was forgotten by his father, right? No. It's the reason why you're here, right? That they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The unity that exists between Christ and his disciples does not destroy the personality of either. They are one in purpose, in mind, and in character, but not in person. Right? It is thus that God and Christ are one. That's a pretty good explanation to me. And distinctions in the scripture, what are distinctions in the scripture as to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? So we'll go through some that just distinguish them. And you know that this is specifically talking about the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And we know we're into the prophecies there. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. Some of us have hair like pure wool, right? <laughs> and his throne, his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. That's a powerful throne. So the throne is a stationary thing and God only has one throne, right? By the way, you look in the Bible, you'll find that God has more than one throne. There are more than one color also. One is white, one is blue. The other one, I'm not sure what color it is, but it moves, okay? Ezekiel is also a, a way, uh, in, his, in the book of Ezekiel, you'll see that his throne is almost hovering. And you'll see that there are angels above it, the angels beside it, and angels underneath, okay? And when he moves, it was, it, it was power and fire, and he came down in Exodus chapter 19, when he came down on the mountain, he came in that manner, and the mountain just stood still, right? It trembled and it smoked, okay? All right. 
the ancient of days and we're like okay the ancient of days okay well um who is the ancient of days okay here like wool his throne like a fiery flame and his wheels is burning fire it talks about a fiery stream coming out before him and we talked about that a while back we know that an is like a fiery being spectacular and if you have a fiery be being was to flash across here in slow motion to us <laughs> well, slow motion to them, so that we could see him flash. Otherwise, he would move so fast, he would blink, and he'd, he'd been gone for quite a while before he, they're very fast. But if he slowed down and came across here as fire, you would see a fiery blaze. What if there were 10 of them? 20, 100, 5,000, a million. And what if they were going back and forth? What would it look like? A fiery stream. A fiery stream of going back and forth to the Father, taking orders and, okay? All right, let's, we're trying to see a distinction here. Verse, let's jump to verse 13. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. So therefore we have two individuals, according to the Bible. There are two individuals and the Son of Man, we understand the Son of Man is referring to the Son of God, who also is Christ, the anointed of the Father. All right? Um, so the Ancient of Days is a distinct name of God the Father. God the Father. Um, and also, let's look at John 17, 11. John 17, 11. And this is the prayer of Jesus. John 17, 11 is the prayer of Jesus. And it says, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come unto thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Right? So he's one with the Father. We know that's perfect unity. And he calls him Holy Father. And therefore, we should not call any human being. Holy Father, because they're not worthy of that name. They're created beings just like us. If you clap your hands real fast behind them, they're going to jump out of their shoes. All right? They didn't see you coming. They didn't know. You caught them by surprise. Okay? You cannot catch God by surprise. The Father is the one Jesus referred to as Holy Father. So not a distinct name for God the Father. Another one, same prayer. John 17, 25, by the way, a very powerful prayer. Amazing. All right. 25, what did it say? Oh, righteous father. All right. There's another distinction. Righteous father. The whole world had not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. So we know that God the Father sends his son and in that council they decided that christ would come for the salvation of the world all right let's go into the son of god right or the distinction what are the distinctive names of jesus by the way um a while back uh, about two years ago my um um graduating class from high school came together on whatsapp and they wanted me to do uh, a, a kind of a chaplaincy, right? And so prayer uh, daily or at 12 noon for the class and things of that nature. And it, the thought came to me as the, I write the prayer to have a distinct name for God the Father because we are told by Jesus to pray to God the Father which is in heaven a distinct name for Jesus, a unique, a unique name for God the Father each day. And it was interesting as I was, each time I would come and I would look and I'd think, um, and either it would be something in my devotion that day, so it would be righteous father, ancient of days, you know, um, the, the, the grand master of the universe, you know, because they, they stole that name grand master, by the way. God defies the real grandmaster. Did that auto wasn't a counterfeit? Okay. But for 365 days, 
there was a name for God the Father. Okay? All right? And, and I believe if we do the Son, it will be this very similar, um, right? But they are both, according to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Lord, which means that they are both self-existent and eternal. That the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are self-existent and eternal because the designation of uppercase L, uppercase O, uppercase RD, right, which is Jehovah or Yahweh, is only for an entity that has those attributes. And it says they are one united, all right? Okay, names of Jesus, distinct roles of Jesus, right? We look at John 1, verse 1, and we're talking about the God has as revealed because eternity will not reveal the, the, the full nature of who God is. He's an eternal being. We can't even conceptualize what eternity is, right? We can't. It says, very familiar, in the beginning was the word, so the Son of God is known as the word and the word was with god and the word was god that's clear the same was in the beginning with god and what else does it say verse three all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made now how far back do you have to be to have made everything and how many things are out there that were made uh, by the way, the, we can look out into the, we had the Hubble, we had a regular telescope, we had our eyes, regular telescopes. Then we have, what's this thing called? James Webb? Pushing deep out into the cosmos. And it saw somebody out there, right? But it saw the evidence of someone's hand, right? And um, I was uh, speaking to one of the uh, uh, scientists, he came up with the radiometric halos. Um, I think it's Robert Gentry, um, and he talks about that there's a, um, their rock, granite rock has a element in it has, that has a half-life of like a couple minutes or seconds, and it's stuck in the rock. It's like frozen, right? So it's like if, if you had a glass of, um, um, and you had bubbles coming up to the top, or it was uh, seltzer water, whatever, if it was frozen, what would that mean? That you poured it in there and then you put it in the refrigerator and froze it? Try it. See if you get some bubbles in there. The bu if, the, if you have seltzer water or if you shake up water, regular water, and there are bubbles in there, how long do the bubbles stay? Not long. Long enough. But what if you had water frozen and the bubbles were still there? That would mean that? instance the radiometric halos in the granite rock don't have a long half-life they dissipate and they're frozen in the granite rock and he says those are creation rocks god spoke them into existence okay so we were talking and his stuff is online at, um it's called halos.com we were talking and he thinks that and it makes sense to me that when god created and it said he created the heavens, also the stars, that everything that we can observe as humans was created on that in those six days. Amen. And we are a galaxy that is isolated, meaning as far as we can see is as far as we're allowed to see. And the unfallen worlds are outside of that. <laughs> okay? You can, I don't care how far you look. You're not going to see them. It's our galaxy that's supposed to be observed, that was created, that we can see. All right? And God made it so. And who created? Through his son, the son of God. And everything that was created was created by the son of God himself, which makes sense to you why he would come and be our redeemer, right? Why he would come to be the one who pledged himself because from his hands we were molded, man and, and woman. And now 
the um, the woman first, then the man sins, and the world is in chaos. He pledges himself to redeem after we sin, right? The foundations of the earth, okay? He pledged, and therefore he is called up uh, the creator and the redeemer, okay? So the redeemer, all right, is also a name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was, of course, come to reveal what? The character of the Father. He was come to show us who the Father is because the world was obscured and we had bad thoughts about God the Father. Do we have bad thoughts about fathers now? Do you find that that think it's that by accident? All right. He wanted to justify his father's character in his kindness, in his mercy, in his comforting of people on earth, right? So we know mostly about Jesus. And when we more know more about Jesus, we know about the Father. That's right. And the Father is the one that draws us through his son, Jesus Christ. They are as one. We also, we also have Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 that reveals uh, Jesus also. Hebrews chapter 1 that reveals that to us. Um, and the thing about... Um, um, this is that you'll find it John 1, Hebrews 1, and Revelation chapter 1, right? All right, that's what we're going to find. John 1, um, Hebrews 1, and Revelation chapter 1, a revelation of who Jesus is, right? And what does Hebrews chapter 1 uh, um, tell us as we look um, into these things? Which, you know, I would say um, of yourself, um, um, study these things out. Um, make sure that you are um, familiar with them yourselves. Uh, compare scripture with scripture. And, and we're going to see uh, basically what does um, the father say about um, his, their son in um, Hebrews. And we want to compare that to Revelation uh, chapter one um, in who he says he is. Let's let's take a look at Revelation. We'll come back to Hebrews in uh, Revelation chapter one, um, and we'll look at that. Revelation chapter one, and let's look at verse eight, right? Let's look at verse eight. We can look at verse five. It says, Revelation chapter one, verse five, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved, loved us and washed us from our sin is his in his own blood. Keep coming down. Verse 8, what does he say of himself? I am? All right. The. And the. First and the last. The first and the last. What else does he say? Say it, the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. All right? The Almighty. Um, he is the Almighty God. And where does that leave him in reference to his father? Is his father Almighty? Yes. And they are... They are one. They are one uh, together. And let's look at what, time has run away. Let's look at what um, God says, the Father says about his son. And we want to leave time for the Holy Spirit. What does God, the Father, say about his son? Um, looking at Hebrews chapter one, uh, what verse are we looking at? Um, and it's, verse one says, God who at sundry times and in Diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, had in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, which connects with the other scripture, right? Okay. 
And what else does he say here? Ah, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the, off the majesty on high. I think that's probably one of the names I use, majesty on high, which would distinguish the God, the Father. But let's jump down to verse 8. Verse 8, what does it say? But unto the Son he said, Thy throne, O, and ever a righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So God the Father referred to his Son as, as God. All right. Okay. And we know that part of the attributes of a person is that they speak, they think, they can designate, right? Let's look at the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we don't want to take too much time. Let's look at the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 5. Let's look at Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. And let's see if the Holy Spirit is in any way in the Bible speaking. Does he say anything? Does he designate anything? Does he, what does it say? Five, verse three. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan, is this the one I'm looking for? That's one of them. <laughs> this is the designation of um, the Holy Spirit being God. Um, why hath Satan filled that heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So it's designated the Holy Spirit as God. Okay, now let's look at Acts chapter 13. Uh, that's the one, Acts chapter 13, verse 2. And somebody said the book of Acts should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through man. Verse 2 says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the, ah, what did the Holy Ghost say? So the Holy Ghost must be a, just a wind or the power of God? Because if it's just the power of God, then God the Father is going to say, God the Father said. But it says the Holy Ghost said. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work we're into, I have called them. So does he know that he exists? And he is infinite, and we are. And so we can tell him something, right? All right, he has revealed this to us, his conversation. And when they had fasted and prayed, verse 3, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Verse 4, so they being sent forth by the departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Do you know someone else who was led of the Holy Spirit, who was sent by the Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ himself. You know, and I used to wonder, why did he send him to be tempted? Oh, man. I said, hey, wait a second. He is also a conqueror he is mighty he is sending them out to go and defeat satan that's why he's going in victory he's led off him into the wilderness to defeat satan in all of the temptations he's leading jesus out as a conqueror to conquer sin in those three forms lust of the flesh pride of life and Lust of the eyes, right? The Holy Spirit, he knows how to get victories, all right? And we also have Acts chapter 10, verse 19. Acts chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. Let's see if the Holy Spirit speaks again. While Peter 
thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So this is the Holy Spirit speaking. He's a living entity, a person of the Godhead, right? And he gives instructions. We have Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Verse 6, now when they had gone throughout um, Phygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, right? So the Holy Spirit also is strategic as to when things happen, okay? So you say, no, don't do that, do this. Wait, hold, do that. no, do that now. He is, of course, the almighty God Jehovah, Yahweh, three united in mind, character, but individual persons. This is from Evangelism 617. It says, the prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. 615 Evangelism, that's a very powerful compilation. It says there are three living persons of the heavenly trio in the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. You have allies to live this life without sin. Don't be accepting of just sinning and having to repent. Sin. There's victory because God is a victorious God. And he sent his son to die and to suffer so that you could, ah, yeah, well, who can do anything about that? I'm the almighty God, but I can't overcome sin. I just can't do it. I'll just grade you on a curve. We'll work it out. Yeah, we'll come on up here. I know that there was a perfect being that sinned and I cast him out because of it, but y'all sinning, just come on up. We'll work it out. Somebody might ask, then why don't you just let Satan back and shh? We'll hear nothing of that. Because if he was to let us back there with sin in our hearts, why don't he just let Lucifer, Satan, back up there? He's more perfect than we ever were. You follow? But we have to be surrendered to the almighty God and we're saved by grace through faith, not of any works that we can do. But when we're saved and we're under the power of the Holy Spirit, he works through us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. He's working out in us his desires and therefore the works that we do, we credit to ourselves and my resilience to overcome sin. I pulled repentance out of my heart. And it was acceptable to God. No. No. When God converts us, he works with our heart, right? And what does he do when he works with our heart? He kind of remakes it. Yeah? He kind of readjusts it. He kind of heals our heart. Huh? He what? Oh, it, it's a transplant. He cuts. By our consent, you have got, got surgery, you have to sign a consent form to give you heart surgery to take out your old, wicked, stony, evil, sinful, wretched heart. Even God can't work with that and give you a new one. And then that new one's going to be sinning, right? You follow what I'm saying? We still have a learning process, but Understand that he wants us to be perfect as he is perfect. Why would he want us to suffer on this sin? Why would you do that to your child who you love? Have you ever taken a splinter out of your child's hands or finger? Yeah. You left some in there? Yeah? Hey, they can, it's not that much pain. You took the whole thing out. He wants to take all sin out of us. All right? He wants to take all sin out of us. And all three. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit 
the Godhead, the three living persons of the heavenly trio are pledged for your salvation. There's something else that the spirit wants. It's in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. As I close Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, I hope this has been clear. I hope it is food for additional study on your part. Reference these scriptures and go line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. All the way to the back of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. And this is basically my appeal to you. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. And it says, and the city lieth. Oh, that's, that's 21, 22. <laughs> that's a good scripture also, but let's go to the right one. Verse 16, there we go. I, Jesus, were sent have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And 17, and the spirit and the bride say come. And let them that hear it say come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life. Freely. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are calling you. They want you to be in the greatest fellowship you've ever seen. Friends on top of friends on top of friends, everywhere you see, you're going to meet your guardian angel who's been with you from all the way through. How much does your guardian angel want to speak with you face to face? How much a friend do you have that knows every single nuance of your life and has seen the power of God to change you into a child of the king? That's where he wants you to be. So the Holy Spirit is calling you today to a new life, to renewed insight, to understanding, to kindness, kindness and a transformation that can be seen by the people closest to you that they might say, you know what? That's God working in you. That's, I know you. And that must be God that's working in you. Okay. So my appeal today is that if you hear that call of the Holy Spirit and you want to renew that desire, if you want to renew your commitment to God, I'm inviting you just to raise your hands where you are. And God sees that. God sees that. And I'll pray that we will respond to this invitation to the kingdom of heaven. We can't even imagine it. Beauty upon beauty. We need new bodies to experience this place. And guess what? He's going to give us new bodies. So I'll pray as we uh, close and God will remember those who raised their hands. My loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this great opportunity to hear your truth and your light, dear Lord. We thank you for just being um, a God that is almighty, with your Son and the Holy Spirit to save us for eternity, Father. There's so much that awaits us in heaven beyond our dreams, Father. And you have down here, even by your mighty power, a way to work as your son worked, without sin, overcoming from victory to victory to victory, giving comfort, mercy, and tenderness and humility. Father, we ask that you will remember those who raised their hands, Father, that they will be renewed in spirit in their um, desire for you, Father, and that the habits of their life might be in tune with that as they rededicate their lives and their hearts to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen.